My name is Avon Kolos, and that is my email address, my website, and uh, as Kanak is mentioned in the URL of that, it says uh, gimp.org. Uh, the main thing I'm kind of known for is to be the maintainer of Gaggle, which is the actual core image processing engine of um, GIMP, which is a data flow based system where you connect nodes together into a graph and uh, load images, they get manipulated and you get results. And this is how the development version of GIMP is doing all of its image processing, version 2.9, which according to the maintainer of GIMP should be released as GIMP 2.10 later this year. I'm afraid it will slip over New Year again, but we'll see. What I'm planning to talk about today is um, uh, not GIMP, not Giggle. Um, I want to talk about uh, how complicated the uh, platform for doing graphical user interfaces is on Linux, but also kind of in general. There is a lot of things to be aware of or think about, or if you wonder how something works, there's loads of documentation and books to kind of uh, go through. And back in the 80s, the world was simpler. You could have books like this. It's a about 650 page book that tells you everything about the hardware of the Commodore 64, about programming it in basic, but also in machine code. It tells you, mm, all interfaces and how things stick together. Um, the Commodore 64 was called Commodore 64 because it had 64 kilobytes of memory. And you had a map that could tell you where everything was on the machine. Um, and again, kind of referring to the book I showed, this is an excerpt of it. And um, this is about the joysticks on the Commodore 64. You could just read what was at the memory address DC01, or in decimal, 56,321, and you would know the state of uh, one of the joysticks. And the same with another address um, for the other one. And we you can see here again a map of the Commodore 64. And a little part of it is the I.O. They also have the audio chip, so by uh, poking values into some part of memory, you manipulate the hardware. You could also do what is called peak to read back. And uh, it's all is written out in those 650 pages, ending up giving you a complete explanation of how to make um, the Commodore 64 do advanced, much faster things than uh, basic as well. Uh, the PC is basically kind of the same. Here is uh, before one started using Windows. Uh, and still, this is how, when they, a regular PC without an UEFI BIOS boots, this is the memory map. And um, one part of it is a video memory. And uh, by writing contents in there, things showed up on screen. So I started out writing such things in assembly and uh, got the ability to write things into the graphics of the computer. Under Linux, um, everything is a file. Files with additional mysterious commands which are documented which are abstracted by libraries, which are further abstracted by libraries, so you no longer know where things are. And uh, then you end up with this kind of see of like an overview of the platform, so which could be like a starting point for like figuring out what types of documentation you should search for and seek out. But there's multiple things doing all the things as well. Um, and uh, the simplest way of doing graphics under Linux is the frame buffer device. And that is a device that can be opened up with the memory map, which is something you can do in C. They say that I have this file that I have open, I have a file descriptor, and 
please open it up so that I can just uh, manipulate memory and the file will change on disk. And that is the way you're supposed to use this devfp. And I was kind of thinking as an experiment a couple of years back is like, well, what if we, for like regular programming as well, could try to uh, do this memory mapping, but basically get like almost like the uh, map you had on the Commodore 64, so that you uh, uh, could do both sound and graphics and input everything through one single memory mapped file, which has uh, predefined memory locations for um, doing things, and end up creating this little project called Memory Map Machine. And it is a library, and it has functions for saying that I want to create a new memory map machine, and uh, you can write to the buffer, you can also get messages from it, but um, at the core of it, it is a data structure that contains of a header followed by a description of a frame buffer and some specific data structures that get memory mapped. And um, then I have another program which then um, also opens up the same memory map file, which then creates the window, gets the events, and acts as the hardware, communicating uh, with the program you've written that thinks it has a um, virtual hardware machine it's talking to. And uh, the very, very simplest version of this doesn't use this library at all. It has hard-coded addresses. For where in this memory map file the PID should be, the title of the window, the within height, a desired within height if you're actually going to resize it. And um, on one particular memory location, there is a byte indicating what is the state of the buffer. And this is that you can say that I'm done drawing, please display the contents. And when the contents have been displayed, it um, synchronizes with the client so they agree on how they do things. So I have then a, a function that creates a dummy such buffer and it just pokes values into those constant memory addresses and returns a pointer to a memory buffer. I'm just gonna skip clicking through. The people who understand C, they kind of see what's going on here. But I've here, in 138 lines of code, written a client that can speak this protocol. And uh, I can compile that to into a static file, um, which is, I think, oh, that's, So I have, okay, completely static. I have a 28K binary with absolutely no link dependencies or anything. And I have a host using SDL. And if I launch this raw client, huh? let me... Why didn't this work now? I'm going to do quite a few more demos, so uh, expect things to crash. <laughs> uh -huh. There. I'm running the raw client I made. I had to recompile the host. So um, that is an SDL window created by the MMM SDL process, and then it has launched the raw client. And I can show some of those other tiny clients I had in there. 
Um, or have a more fun one, this GIF player. Okay, let's skip further on with The way that I do input in this memory mapped file is uh, instead of having uh, hard-coded constants, I uh, just use strings and um, all pointer interactions are prefixed by things like most motion, most press, most drag, and then the coordinates, which can be floating point coordinates, uh, followed by which button or device, but I have seven there. It, probably would mean that you're on a touch screen and it's one of the first few touch points. Um, the same kind of events can be used for passing messages. Key bindings are passed through as full-on strings describing what they are, space or control. And um, I pass Unicode characters and ASCII just on through as the strings themselves. So if it's a single Unicode point, it is a single thing that you have typed. Um, these are kind of further things I was thinking about extending this idea of like memory mapping the virtual I.O. devices with as well. So I could have a proper double buffering, be able to read a webcam in the same way so that the client program doesn't have to link to any of the things uh, it has, but also have things for accelerometers. <coughs> but then when it comes to like things I'm playing with myself, and uh, what I often use for graphics is something called Cairo. Cairo is um, a vector graphics library that works the way that PostScript works, or um, you can define Bezier curves, arcs, and then you can stroke them or fill them. Uh, but Cairo is a drawing API. And Cairo doesn't allow you to have events or interaction in any way. Um, Cairo is also very similar to the canvas element of HTML5. You have exactly the same commands you can do for drawing. Um, but if you want to have uh, interaction, you are stuck with re-implementing the idea of what was there on the screen, what have you pressed. Uh, one way of kind of going around that is uh, with SVG. SVG is a different way of doing vector graphics. Um, and uh, with SVG, you can do the same thing as with HTML, that you can attach um, uh, interactions and events on elements. Um, but to create a full interface uh, with SVG, uh, you have this entire tree data model that you attach events to, and it's not as... Uh, easy to draw something as directly with Cairo. With Cairo, you describe the parts and transformations, and um, uh, I stumbled across this thing. Something called their immediate mode GUI. Uh, it's an OpenGL-based immediate mode user interface, um, which um, works in the way that you draw, like you do with Cairo, but every time you draw the screen, you get as input uh, the most coordinates, where the most currently is, the current state of the buttons, and um, all the events and all interactions happen in line with the code. That's the extreme version of immediate mode UI. And um, I decided to experiment with this and came up with um, a way of making Cairo interactive. So here I have a bit of source code that, again, is in C. We have a main function that creates a new UI. It says what code to run for the UI. And the main thing it does is to do some translations, and then it uh, moves to the first coordinate, does the Bezier curve, sets some colors, and then it loops through the coordinates and draws circles. 
And for each of the circles, it uh, listens for dragging events. And the dragging events shall manipulate the position of the circle. I will show how this program ends up working. And the um, coordinate system used in the callback um, is the coordinate system that Cairo had when it drew and registered the events. So I can um, modify the code and say that we um, also want to rotate the result. Um, And then run it again. Ah, that's too much. Let's just do something like this. So that we still get a slight modification of the thing we had. But the interactions should still work because it's a circle that registers where we do. So this means that anything that I'm able to draw with Cairo, I can add interactions to. Um, so if I have a data structure that I know how to traverse myself, I can um, draw it directly on the screen. I don't have to create a tree structure that can um, be manipulated. The other things that Microraptor GUI gives me is the ability to style text and um, other things. So this window is produced by this source code. Here we don't have any interactions. But we can also, um, in the extensions on top of Cairo, there is um, the ability to register callbacks responding to um, pressing of links. So here I've then built up on top of having Cairo for drawing things. I can also use Cairo for styling text and using CSS for creating margins. Um, we still have the gold and um, yet another example that goes further is when I press hello world it increments a number but this allows me to um, in my user interface just have one function that uh, knows how to draw the user interface and as it is being drawn, whether I uh, listen for um, events on a Bessier shape or um, listen for interactions with text around something being printed, what it ends up doing is that it goes one iteration through this UI function, building up a list of all parts of the screen that can be interacted with. And then it waits for the user to do something, either pressing on the screen or writing on the keyboard. Um, and then it goes through its list of registered callbacks and figures out what is responsible. Microraptor GUI also has bindings in Lua. And this is a... Lua is slightly easier to write, is more like a basic than C is. And the code I'm showing on screen now in 281 lines of code um, is an implementation of Pong. And things are running slower on this screen than on my laptop. I think it's one of the converter boxes here that do it. But my screen is multi-touch and I can manipulate the paddles independently, and there's nothing in the code that actually does that, that happens by itself. 
uh, when each of them register for the drag events, um, which is quite nifty. And here is a photo from the Gairanga Fjord. But this is a more complicated UI. Um, this is where Gaggle or GIMP related things kind of enter into the picture. This is a prototype UI I'm working on myself and uh, working out how to do things with GIMP as a kind of a small photo manager built on top of Gaggle, the library I'm maintaining for GIMP. So we can make more complicated UIs with it as well. Uh, I also have a little video editor, which this thing was edited in, but I'm gonna skip ahead to something else. How many here recognize this file listing? So, three quarters of the audience. Um, these are the files necessary to make a bootable disk uh, for MS-DOS. Um, three of them are binary, and one of them at the bottom is um, a batch file where you can edit and you have a script and say the things that are supposed to happen when you turn on the computer and have you insert the disk diskette. Here's a yak. Uh, I don't know why I'm on a mission to shave it, but I've ended up trying to get hairs of this jack. Um, and um, this is a collaborative project with Casper. Um, so many yaks. Every single little thing that is not green hair is not a yak to shave. Um, and uh, this is kind of what I've ended up with. It's uh, something that corresponds to the thing we had um, for DOS. Um, they do different things. This is the bootloader for Grub for EFI. The whole thing is a fat file system, just like DOS used. And uh, this is a Linux kernel. This is a um, file system containing uh, many small packages. And uh, these belong to SysLinux, another bootloader for um, Linux that works with regular BIOSes. And um, this is my replacement for uh, autoexec bat. So I can stick all of these files onto a USB stick, and um, I have a system where I can modify this bootloader and put more files onto it. So I'm going to execute uh, a command here now, which launches QMU um, on a virtual version of such a USB image. I'm going to boot up a Linux. And we've ended up with a login. And here we have, um, I'm not sure if you can read that at all, but I've entered into the folder containing the actual USB device, and I'm going to create boot.lua. I'm going to launch. Uh, I'm going to launch. I think that's what it's called. Yep. I'm going to launch um, a game with my Lua script. I'm going to reboot this computer. Uh, 
And I could have actually put that entire um, file for this in the root folder as well, which is probably what I should have done. Um, so we're gonna quit this thing. And go to the, back to the folder. And now nah, I'm gonna do something else instead. I'm gonna um, launch this. And what this is, is a um, window manager that um, uh, where each client is one of these memory mapped machines. And the window manager itself is also uh, such a memory map machine client. And one of the fun things I can do with this is that I can um, quit this Microraptor GUI host, that's a window manager written in C, and uh, use one written in Lua instead. Ah, can't I? Ah, um, emergency fix. And if I launch the um, Lua window manager, all the clients are still running because the clients didn't rely on the window manager being present. They are just files in um, a folder on the temp called MRG. And there's three files because there's three clients running. And the um, window manager also has like a, like a tiled mode, which is a bit fun. Allows me to have two main windows open. And uh, where I haven't quite gotten this to yet is where I um, would basically take this fat file system on this memory stick, which has those magical files, the read-only file system containing packages, um, and say that the entire graphical bits all the small games, the window manager and all those, would just be Lua files that sits um, in the root folder. And then it would be possible to uh, edit all the Lua files. And uh, that is the entirety of the graphical part of the operating system. And you wouldn't have to care about all the yucks hidden uh, in the initRD, uh, the initial root file system. Um, this thing also has an on-screen keyboard. The reason for that is that I also have memory mapping machine hosts that I can run on a Kobo e-ink reader. And when the code is written in Lua, I don't have to recompile anything to test some code on my PC and write it in Lua and then run exactly the same thing working on the e-ink reader. And uh, uh, I like some aspects of this system because it's a lot more compact than the current um, set of things you need to understand to do development on computers. Um, this is another one of my web pages online. Um, uh, most people who support me with monthly donations, they do it because I work on GIMP and Gaggle and the graphics things there. But I do like to do experiments. So this is kind of things that I've been doing long before I started the Patreon, but also I'm going to continue doing. And uh, I didn't quite shave enough yaks to basically say, here is a bootable USB image that you can play with. Um, well, I actually have that USB image but it doesn't work on my computer to do it out on HDMI, and um, it doesn't work with the actual touchpad I have here, but it works with the touchpad that QMU emulates. So I have to settle for that thing for the demonstration. So that is roughly the things I was about to go through. So we got questions. The tough question here is, don't we have a Raspberry Pi image that actually works? 
Well, the Raspberry Pi image works, the uh, combined BIOS and UFI images work, but it's not fully rigged up to the state where um, you have like a self-updating system um, on top of the base operating system. Um, I could do another fun little demo for the people when it comes to bootstrapping. I wanted a terminal, but all of these should also be commands. Um, so the distro that has been used for building this is called um, Isthmus, and its package manager is called IDE. Those are English and Norwegian words for the same thing. And the easiest way to bootstrap a system with this is to um, fetch IDE, make it executable, and execute this command. I'll, I'll just, just execute just IDE alone first. And that gives you help about available commands for IDE. IDE is um, a shell script, um, but it's also a package manager. And one of the fun um, commands it has is just running for shell. No, I am inside a change root jail uh, containing this distro. Um, and if we know exit, we have populated this folder with quite a lot of files. And um, uh, it's quite similar to many other Linux distros that uh, have rolling releases and uh, descriptions of how to download from source and build all packages. Part of the intention also has in like making like a proper USB image that people could experiment with is that it should actually contain all the source code needed to rebuild itself. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Another fun thing you can do with uh, it is um, Crossing fingers and hoping this works. Eh. Mm. Ah. Nope. So I will run that command uh, on my actual. Hmm? Hmm. No, I'm going to give up on that. <laughs> but yes, um, we do have a Raspberry Pi image and uh, We also have um, I'm I'm failing a bit now. <laughs> Sorry. Do, do we have uh, any other questions? Um, where do you get the input events uh, in your uh, in your input event the M MRG? Uh, system um, MRG has more than one backend MRG can either uh, sit on top of memory map machine or on top of GTK uh, so when I was doing it now on my computer I was using GTK under Valent uh, but it works under any of the uh, memory map machine hosts as well and uh, where it gets its input events from um, can then be either yeah, through however GTK does it or however one of the memory map machine hosts does it. So it's usable enough that you, you could use this for some simple uh, 
or some actual programs. If the window managers I showed were um, all implemented with it. So yeah, for simple programs, it works. Um, I can also quit this whole demonstration and show a more complicated um, application, which is the video editor I've talked about. This video editor is proof of concept, but it's um, yeah, it's a more complicated UI than the just demos I was showing us was going through things. So as a system to play with, it all works, and uh, I do hope to rig it up to the state where we yes, have images both for Raspberry Pi, e-ink devices, and USB for running on a PC where uh, there is example Lua code for a full small program launcher, some small games, but things that people can study and take apart and modify. I also had a question. Uh, uh, I read that you like to use it for education uh, purposes, so I'm wondering what is the plan about it, about this? Well, that's kind of like where the, if I think, if, um, as something that people can experiment with and actually get an understanding for, uh, going closer back to the roots of how things were with the microcomputers and how things also were with DOS, in that you can understand most of the system. And I do think that the USB key that I was like showing with the small little boot script and like launching the games. Uh, that with an editor there that you could actually modify the system within itself there, but you could also be under Linux or Windows, insert this USB drive and modify the files you see on it in the Lua and then like put it on another computer and boot it. I do think it um, would lend itself well to uh, being used in the introduction to programming user interfaces and give people the freedom to experiment with the full uh, multitasking UI. You will see it like a part of an introductory course uh, for programming, right? Not necessarily, yeah, or uh, any kind of course on uh, programming, but also for people to uh, uh, get it and experiment with themselves. Okay, thank you. And uh, I was wondering also about Cairo. I, is um, how do do you integrate it with HTML? Is do you do it in the same way as SVG, or because you said you can style it with CSS? So uh that is uh, this Micro Raptor GUI uh, layer, uh, which uh, extends Cairo with more functionality. Okay. The Micro Raptor GUI extends Cairo with uh, interactivity but also the ability to use CSS for styling text. Um, I can run another So this is the window manager again, but now running on my computer. And here is a tiny little, almost web browser-like thing. But yeah, so uh, Microraptor GUI gives you the ability to um, uh, create user interfaces that can be even styled with external CSS style sheets. So it's taking the web technologies and uh, reusing them in a different way. Thank you very much. Um, if we don't have more questions, I will uh, thank our speaker for a very nice presentation, rich in demos. So we
you didn't get bored during the presentation, it was a lot to follow up. And I hope you are joining for the party, which is, is going to start soon.